Welcome back to another edition of Zero Blog 30. Today we have one round in the magazine and we're going to be talking about Project 100,000. A couple weeks ago, I came across an article that talked about Project 100,000. I had never heard about it. I asked the, G the ZBT squad if they had ever heard about it and both Kate and Cons both said no. And when we looked it up, we started reading about it. I was like, we need to talk about this because it is a lesson learned that wasn't learned and some of the things, some of the same mistakes that they made with what, with, Oh my God, let me start over again. I can't figure out how I'm doing it. I'm Japsy edits. <clears throat> Welcome back to another edition of zero blog 30. Today we have one round in the magazine and it's about project 100,000. If you haven't heard about project 1000 or 100,000, it's a program that took place in the latter parts of the Vietnam War, and it was designed to do something that we're doing now, that we did after the Korean War, that we did during the surge of Iraq and Afghanistan. It shows unequivocally that we have no lessons learned whatsoever, and even when the brass, the high brass Secretary of Defense is, and all kinds of things, is it Secretaries of Defense? Secretaries yes. of Defense, right? Yeah, that's correct. That That's correct way to pluralize that. Thank you, Cons. Appreciate that. Shout out West Point and their grammar classes there. Excellent work. That's why it's one of the most prestigious universities in the world, I would mm -hmm. say. Kate mm -hmm. also, Fordham University up there. And I think UTSA goes without saying. So we're going to get into... The Harvard of Texas. Someday. Yeah. Uh, well, the Harvard of South Texas as well. Harvard of South say. Texas. Right. Sorry. Right. The South Central, in fact. <laughs> but we're going to get into that right now. So Kate... Walk us through what happens in Project 100,000. I went through several different sources to find this, and this is the best I can do. I didn't go to West Point. I don't do research papers, and I don't even know what MLA format is. Kate does. Kate, walk us through what's going on with Project 100,000. Yeah, basically, this is the tale of an extreme lowering of standards and what that can lead to, um, for better or worse, but in this case, seems like mostly worse. I was in the military mid surge for Afghanistan. And I rem I feel like every unit had a couple folks that you were like, oh, as that waiver feel like you shouldn't be, maybe you shouldn't be here and not in a mean way, but in a, it's best for you that you should not be here kind of way right. um, that it almost felt cruel that they were there yes. because mm -hmm. the inability yes. to adapt, yada, yada. So reading this kind of, I was like, Oh yeah, this is like that times a hundred thousand quite <laughs> frankly. True. So, for many people, joining the military is a way to lift oneself out of poverty, find better opportunities, and get a better shot at life. Uh, college, job training, sense of discipline, purpose, risking one's life for the sake of others gives you this feeling that you can do almost anything afterwards. So there's a trade-off to be sure, one that not everybody is comfortable with, but those with the aptitude and desire, it might be a trade-off worth taking. Like, okay, I might lose my life. <laughs> But look at all this other stuff I could gain. Um, and Cons, you didn't do it for to get out of poverty. You went to West Point to play football. And yeah. You become an officer. Kate, was there a financial aspect whenever you joined? I mean, definitely. Because my parents, when I failed out of college, they were like, you can't stay here. We don't know what your plan is. But like, we love you. But we're washing our hands of you right now until you figure it out on your own. And I didn't have a plan. And the military was like, Oh, we've got one full, you know? And it seems <laughs> <pretty> nice. Guaranteed <laughs> paycheck, roof over my head, food, mm -hmm. and eventually go back to college for free was huge. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Same with me. I was wanted to go to school. I mean, obviously I've told the story many times that I didn't have any real wisdom or any real life experience that I could impart wisdom on other people. But definitely, it was the same thing. I grew up, I think, boot camp. After I left boot camp, it was the first time I had more than $300 in my bank account. So, yeah. I I mean, getting out and being like, two grand, I'm really yeah. PAX, PAX Sun. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I pay so much money at PAX Sun. It's crazy. Hey, uh -huh. let me ask you two, because I'm curious now that you both went to school after the military. I have to imagine that you were more prepared to do school at the college level after being in the military, right? Well, I had a 1.8 at IUP and I had a 3.9 at Fordham University. And I 
I loved my classes afterwards because I had a new appreciation and perspective on. So yes, absolutely. Tons of positive changes came out of my time yeah. in the military as so much as I bitch about it sometimes. So definitely trade-offs though, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I'm better in life for it, but I also jump when a car backfires now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. There, there's a give and take. There's a little bit of a give and take. Yeah. Fourth um, of July is kind of a freaking nightmare every year now, but whatever. <laughs> But whatever, you know, yeah. nothing a couple nooners can't can't dampen, you know. I'm sure they'll love that. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> the desire and aptitude don't always go hand in hand. Sometimes both are absent entirely. And that was the case with Project 100,000. Which, by the way, fantastic name. It's oh, a great absolutely. name. Absolutely. Yeah. And do you mind me asking, Chaps, where did you find, like, who did the research on this? Like, who... So uh, this is from, there's going to be parts that are from the defense archives. There's going to be parts that were from the Naval War College. Yeah. There's parts that are from some New York Times articles in 2007. Really, it's a smorgasbord, the thing that I put together. Of I just want to show that you did your research and this is coming from the government. Like these are government yeah. historical documents. That, so very cruelly nicknamed McNamara's morons which immediately cruel. I even said to chaps, I was like, I don't know if you should put that on the thumbnail. He's like, that's what they called it. <laughs> like, Project yeah, that's what they called the people. I, it, I mean, so Project 100,000 was the official name, but from the get go, it was called as morons. And right. Uh, I mean, if you look at some of the standards, hard to argue. Like, I don't like to call dumb people morons. I like to call smart people morons whenever they're being dumb. But like, people that have, that was a terrible way to Any, say yeah. it. Anyways, yeah. Anyways. Let's move on from there. Yeah, no. Okay. <laughs> Project 100,000. I'm not really racing anything, Kate, ever. Pro Project 100,000 <laughs> was an initiative started under, you guessed it, Robert McNamara, thus McNamara's morons, during the Vietnam War. In this project, over 320,000 men were either drafted or volunteered for service, nearly all of whom, all 320,000, failed the armed forces qualification test which is used to determine basic eligibility for military service. Project 100,000 inductees placed in the lower 10th to 30th percentiles of the test. Normally, candidates who placed in that low category, it's category IV. I, I'm like, I know the guys are watching me unable to read these Roman numerals. IV. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. That's category four. <laughs> people who are category four then, they're deemed unsuitable for military service and no matter how desperate the military is usually they're like sorry cat four you you're just it's just not going to be a good fit it's not going to work out project 100,000 however was an experiment to see whether military entry requirements could be lowered they needed and, uh, bodies these these people right like these i would imagine their parents are very happy that they're going in because if you they have are. somebody that is so intellectually stunted that they can't pass the ASVAB, there has to be very little legit job prospects, right? So if you go into the military, you do have a career. You have the ability to get health insurance, all those different things that Kate and I look for. If you're a parent of one of those folks, you're like, yes, this is a great thing to go in, maybe not in the height of Vietnam War, but this is a great yeah. to get your life together, essentially. Well, and if you're one of these people who wanted to join. So the, and the project's goals were to combat poverty. Lyndon B. Johnson had recently begun his war on poverty program. And thanks to the GI Bill and other veterans initiatives, military service, great way to get out of poverty. But mm -hmm. this was a nice bonus to the project's other purpose, the Vietnam War needing more bodies. And lowering recruitment standards was one way to get them. Some had physical impairments, some were overweight, underweight, but most troublingly, Many had a low mental aptitude, often to the point of being mentally handicapped. I think Many... the best representation of this to just give people a picture, if you've ever seen Full Metal Jacket, Pile, mm. yeah. yeah, exactly what that is. Um, since this was an, um, um, many were illiterate. Since this was an experiment, a small cadre of soldiers were also admitted under the program to act as controls. These were normal soldiers. Once in the military, and they put they put in the documents for McNamara's morons. They put normal soldiers. That's horrible, like, right? Like yeah. that. If you're called normal, that implies that the other population is abnormal, right? Yeah. 
And once in the military, Project 100,000 soldiers were treated as any other soldier to do otherwise would void the experiment. Various human resource personnel wrote up anonymized <laughs> monthly reports anonymized, on the soldiers. Thank right? you. Documenting yeah. their progress in military life and more. And the results were not good. In fact, Pro they were bad. Yeah. <laughs> like horribly bad. Project 100,000 soldiers were about three times more likely to be killed in action. In addition to being physically and mentally ill-equipped for war, they were unlikely to qualify for technical training that would otherwise keep them off the front lines. As a result, many of them were used as infantry soldiers. Hey, we're not gonna spend the time and money because we know you're not gonna learn this specialty that they're using on, on the base right now, so off you go outside the wire. This whole human experiment just kind of <laughs> makes me feel like icky. Yep. Oh, big uh, time. They were also reassigned 11 times more often than their peers and were between seven and nine times more likely to require remedial training. 11 and seven. That's so, I mean, 11 times more likely is crazy town. And they were more likely to be arrested as well and have other issues. Um, Cause I'm sure this raised a bunch of social issues as well, coming oh, yeah. from extreme poverty, probably not getting along with the other fellas a lot of the times. Cause they were just tossed into these infantry units for the ones that did survive the war, you're thinking, well, maybe at least these guys who made it through, their lives were better. Their outcomes were worse than comparable to men who did not join military service. So men of equal mental capacity who did not join fared much better than the, the guys who did. They earned 7000 less per year than their civilian peers, uh, equivalent to a little under 16000 today. They were more likely to be divorced and less likely to own a business. The reasons for these differences not entirely clear could be the trauma of war, the lack of access to social programs available in civilian life. And I'll say this too, like I'm not the smartest, but I'm not on the, the most. Kate, I don't think you're anywhere near what these and people I, are. And right I now. still have trouble. Kate, Kate goes from saying that she graduated with a three nine to being yeah. like, look, I can read folks. <laughs> but I'm just saying I still have difficulty navigating the systems and my yeah, benefits true. and Very sorting true. shit out. And when that a roadblock doesn't listen, that's a complicated web of different websites and everything. You're not alone in that. I don't but think I'm just saying, imagine if I couldn't read, right? Imagine right, right, if right, I yeah. didn't have access to technology. Imagine. So these guys, sure. They were promised benefits and sold this whole big thing to get them to join. But it's like the military knew we're getting warm bodies and we're probably not going to have to deal with them afterwards. Cause they're not going to mm -hmm. be able to figure it out. Or they're going to um, die, which yeah. is horrible right. to say, but they yeah. probably just thought of that. Yep. Right. Um, offering ineligible soldiers a pass in order to give them a leg up out of poverty through the military just straight up did not work. A review of Robert McNamara's In Retrospect, The Tragedy and Lessons of Vietnam, published in the Washington Post, quoted Herb DeBose, a first lieutenant who served in the Vietnam War, and he summed, he summed up the project like this. I saw Robert McNamara when he resigned from the World Bank, crying about the poor children of the world. But if he did not cry at all for any of those men he took in under Project 100,000, then he really didn't know what crying is all about. Many under me weren't even on a fifth grade level. I found out they could not read, no skills before, no skills after. The army was supposed to teach them a trade in something, only they didn't. And so the military like sold these guys just false hopes and then they were screwed afterwards i do you think that this is the quintessential version of good initiative bad judgment like yeah. with, with lyndon do. johnson with lyndon johnson's um wanting to have war on poverty you have all these people that don't have good jobs prospects i could see that it being like an idea of complete socialism where it in theory, it's a great idea, but in actuality, it probably doesn't work. And in a lot of ways throughout history, it doesn't work, no matter how much you are trying to make that thing work. Right. It, it, it assumes that you need next to no intelligence or skills to be in the military. It's basically... Which is Here's incredibly offensive to people that are oh, in the military too. Especially and especially those who like who are in it for a career. Yeah. It's essentially saying to be in the military, all you have to be able to do, can you pull a trigger and can you march forward? And that's it. And as we know, 
you know, you don't have to be, you know, a part of Mensa, but you need to be able to think a little bit more critically than that. There are more skills involved, especially depending on what branch of the military you go in. So to, I, I agree with you. I do think it is good initiative because you have this poverty problem. You need, uh, you know, for right or wrong, we won't dive into whether or not we should have been into Vietnam, uh, right or wrong. You, they needed more bodies. This was a way to get more bodies. But to me, the military, like, seemingly a lot of times comes up with a plan, but their plan is only like half complete. And they're like, all right, well, we'll figure out the rest once we get there and, and we'll see what we can do. And then when they actually get to the end point and they're like, Oh, we, we didn't anticipate any of this. So then they're left with this uh, kerfuffle that they don't know what to do. And, and then it becomes an issue as, as we've seen here. But we I'm did have, like, my- go ahead. Kate. Oh. I'm putting on my dark skepticism hat yeah. and I'm saying the top top bubbas in the military are very good at taking advantage of the public's general ignorance of all things military, yeah. mm-hmm. especially when it comes to our government and our leadership in government. And I think they needed warm bodies. And I think it was a real easy sell to say, hey, Lyndon Johnson, you want to look good? Call this the war on poverty. Send them on over. We need bodies for the front line real bad. I think yeah. that's like what it was. And, and I, think- I could see, I think you can make the argument either way, like based mm-hmm. on history. But remember <laughs> about a year ago, or I guess closer to two years ago, when Russia was having all those conscripts that didn't meet the requirements of their normal military. Right. They, were pull- yeah. they were pulling them off farms. They were pulling out of, out of prison, doing all kinds of stuff. We had the ability whenever Vietnam was going on, if you got in trouble for robbery or something like that, They gave you the opportunity to go into the military instead of going to jail. You had like, it's essentially the same thing that we looked at Russia and be like, this is disgusting behavior. How could they possibly do this? And we've done it a couple times too. Maybe not to the same level of cannon fodder, but it's whenever you're dying three times the normal rate, you're getting reassigned 11 times the normal rate. It's really hard to say that we didn't do the same things. Right. And Kate, when you think about the top level brass and the, and the top levels of government making these decisions, I think too often these people are numbers on a piece of paper, right? Mm-hmm. But then oh, when yeah. you get down to that platoon level and you're this platoon leader, you're a lieutenant, and you have these people in your platoon, then it becomes real. And you look at the, this person and you think to yourself, how is this person even qualified to, to be in, in my platoon? I, I mean – I don't think maybe to this level, but I definitely, I've told the story about the, the, the soldier I had who, you know, decided to marry a, uh, an exotic dancer two weeks before we left. And then she emptied his Classic. bank account. Yeah. That's you know, tale, tale is old as time, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. but there were many times when we were in Iraq, like, and I didn't, you know, do this to embarrass him or, or try to make him feel bad, but I had to pull him aside and kind of like coach him up one-on-one. And my platoon sergeant was awesome. Kept an eye on him. But he was definitely somebody who I thought to myself, if we don't keep a close eye on him, something He's could gonna go wrong. He's going to get someone else killed. Right. Yes. And, and that's, that's the other yeah. thing. You have to worry about everybody else because the action of one can affect everybody else in the platoon as well. Fantastic so, uh, example, cons, because there are some parts, and I don't know if I actually put it in this sheet or not, but there was definitely some parts where they said the amount of time training – the ability, I mean, whenever you think about cognitive ability in the mm. military, it's listening, especially in combat. It's listening to the commands, being able to understand the commands and execute instantaneously. Like this is like people look at military members as dumb at the beginning of this article, like that enlisted folks, especially that they don't have a high level of aptitude for intelligence. But you have to in combat. You get told something to do. You You have to be able to understand that your training is and execute instantly. And that is something that somebody with a lower intelligence ability does not, cannot do. If they had the time and resources to actually train them in a trade or something, it could have been really valuable, but they didn't. It was a Vietnam War and they didn't. Yeah. Um, And there's lots of people who have low ASVAB scores who I served with who did great in the military, who did really well, but just not... At that level, you know what I'm saying? So, and we've seen um, Kate like when we went to boot camp at Paris Island, you do the crucible at the end and you go across that huge tarmac. And they tell you at the time, this tarmac, when people graduated from boot camp, a lot of times they flew straight to Vietnam 
So you had the eight weeks of training at that time. You didn't do any follow on training. And this was at the time because we've been saying army, but that's more of like a generic term in this regard. Mm, yeah. Marines and the soldiers were both part of this unit that they did. And there was some, I didn't put it in out of pride. There was some that would say the Marines took even less intelligence people because they were going, they would take those folks and send them to the super hot areas. The meat grinder. Even worse. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and again, th so there was an article in the New York Times in 2007 when we were on the verge of the big surge between the Bush and Obama administrations. Um, this is an article from that. Despite claims to the contrary by Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, the Army is facing a manpower crisis. Sound familiar? Current <laughs> times. Um, the evidence can be found in two separate reports released last month. And this is the simple fact. Last year, the Army accepted its least qualified pool in a decade. And this is when I was in, was 2007, or 2008 is when I first got in. And there were a few people who, even our higher ups would mutter behind, they're like, they should not, it's like cruel that they're here. They should not be That's here. when I first started hearing the term a lot more as that waiver. And they yeah. legit might have been, you mm, know, yeah. like you think at the time, surely not. Like they're not doing this. Because whenever, I mean, I was an E3, Kate, you were an E3 you, you're not thinking of reading different articles about what's going on with military recruiting or just not politics in general. Nobody gives a shit. No. Well, the, the two people I'm thinking of, one, the one guy from my unit got sent home about a month into Afghanistan because he was considered such a hazard to the other men in the unit and wow. had fucked up so badly in a way that he almost got a bunch of people killed. Do you have and any examples other, of things he did? Was... They tried to put her in the FET team. And after like three weeks, they were like, ap like this person cannot deploy, like cannot, absolutely not going to get people killed and got sent back to her unit. Um, and it's just, it's a waste of everyone's time and money and resources too at that, yeah. like whatever. Kate, do you um, have examples of what that, that, that one person did like in general, just like, I don't want to give like, away who they are. I don't um, think, I, I don't know. Um, if you don't want to, that's fine. I was just kind of curious if you had yeah, examples of but, things. Uh, Give her full Christian name and uh, her social <laughs> no, security. No, not the, not, the, not the woman, the other guy you were talking about when you were like, oh, that you know, if you do these things, it might endanger others. Uh, wandering off was part of it. That's a that big one. I had, I had guys who would just, we'd be out on foot patrols and you'd be like, dude, you're way too far away from us right now. Get back here. Well, I, that can happen. That, yeah, I mean, that, that happened to me. I was only yeah. like four or 500 meters away from everybody else, but it was that's the only, far, dude. Uh, yeah. But I mean, dog handlers are pretty far in yeah. advance, at, at least a uh, 50 to a hundred, you know, like you can, depends on what unit you're with, obviously. But the only other unit that I ever did a foot patrol with was, uh, Third of the 509th, I'll say it. And the third of the 509th, they weren't trained that well. And it was a brand new – as soon as I walked out and I saw it was a second lieutenant, I was Ooh. like, man, like you haven't been in two years because that's an automatic promotion. Like yeah. two years and you're leading people on foot patrols. And I was like came out behind this building. They were supposed to follow me, and I saw the pack of the last person. I was like <laughs> trying to get back. So my first mission, and I'm like – Oh God! I and don't that's know what not I'm a that waiver, right? So right. Yeah. yeah, I feel like I'm decently intelligent. The <laughs> army inducted both more recruits without high school diplomas and more youth, scoring in the lowest category of the aptitude test, category four recruits. Again, we never learn. Welcoming more such recruits into the military has obviously has obvious appeal at a time when numbers are slipping, but the adoption of lower standards to fill the ranks is short-sighted and imprudent. Moreover, continuing this policy would be a mistake for the Army. Um, and this was an op-ed, um, but they then reference Project 100,000. Um, just a terrible thing. The meat grinder, not yeah. good. We don't want to do it again. Um, Mr. McNamara of McNamara's more is the one who created Project 100,000, further concluded that the best way to demonstrate that the induction of new standards men would prove beneficial was to keep their status hidden from their commanders. In other words, Project 100,000 was a blind experiment run on the military amid the escalation. So even worse, say you're a lieutenant over there, cons. You would get a few of these guys and not even be told that they couldn't read or they yeah. weren't 
But also that's kind of tough, right? Because if you are one of these cat four, which I remind the listeners, if you have experience, cat four is bad in everything. If you're cat four and dental, you can't deploy because your teeth, you have a yuck mouth. If you're cat four and like your vaccines or your shots that you need to go places, you're not deployable. So calling these folks cat four, that's a very loaded military term for the worst that you can be. Yeah. I'm wondering though, would I want to know or would I would, you're probably going to figure it out anyway, that maybe <laughs> yeah. they're not cat four, but there's somebody you got to keep an eye on. Like, I don't know how much it, it helps me. I, it might even make it worse if I know that they're. Because you wouldn't have faith and tr- uh, trust, like faith and right. confidence of that I, person. Honestly, I, I would probably just put them in situations where the. They carry stuff. It's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's least likely that they have to do something that has an impact on anybody else. Like, yeah, just just carrying rounds back and forth. Those artillery rounds. But my guy, PFC Taylor. Strong. PFC yeah. Taylor was as dumb as they come, but he would carry stuff wherever you told him. He'd be mm-hmm. like, pick up that thing. And it would be, you would normally need to do a two or three man lift for some of this stuff, but Taylor was yoked about five foot eight <laughs> and just extremely stout guy, like looked like a rugby player, huge. And you'd be like, hey, go take that, those three ammo cans and go put them over there. Full ass ammo cans, which are heavy, and you just stack them, <laughs> walk them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love yeah. Taylor. Well, like you're saying, it was <laughs> favorite. All hold on, one one more thing about Taylor. You know yeah. what his favorite thing to do? His favorite job? What? He loved the uh, police call cigarette butts. He loved it, dude. That's dude, like what a, I loved uh... that too. I loved police calling. Yeah, <laughs> it was like I feel satisfaction whenever, or he would say, I feel good when I go out and I do something that people can notice, which yeah. is a great trait to have, right? Mm-hmm. It's great. That's why I loved him. Just a gentle little bear. And like you said, it wasn't all bad. Sometimes there are success stories. Would you guys mm-hmm. like to hear one of those success stories? Of course, I yes. Wish. Okay. Turbulent era of the Vietnam War. Two unlikely friends found themselves in a complex web of military service. Both in Project 100,000 embarked on a remarkable journey that would change their lives. It's 1967. They get their draft notices. Despite their lower cognitive abilities, they're determined to serve their country. They were among the recruits chosen for Project 100,000. One private, with childlike innocence and unwavering determination, joined as a combat infantryman. The other, assigned to a sport role, worked as a cook. And the two found themselves on different paths within the military, but remained steadfast allies. Then, one day in the thick jungles of Vietnam... um, Complex orders, quick decisions necessary. Shit goes horribly wrong one day, but their physical strength and uncanny ability uh, earn the respect of their fellow soldiers. So everything's going wrong with this unit, but these two are working their asses off and they win everybody over. As the war raged on, both soldiers encountered the horrors and camaraderie of combat. They saw their friends fall in battle and uh, despite their struggles, managed to survive. Well, one day the soldiers are caught in a fierce firefight and one of the private's instincts takes over. He saves several wounded comrades by carrying them to safety, exposing himself to enemy fire. His actions, driven by a simple desire to help his friends, earn him the silver star for valor. The other soldier followed and showed exceptional courage when their unit came under a complex attack. Um, Despite limited cognitive abilities, the heroic soldier demonstrated remarkable composure under fire. Both of these guys... Big time heroes. Um, mm-hmm. So I, what I think this demonstrates, know, though, like just like well, in the Full Metal Jacket, where you know by the end of Basic, Pyle had gotten his stuff together. It's just you need to spend extra time on these people. It's not that they can't do it ever. It's that you have to just spend extra time and energy to get them to that baseline standard. And and most people just don't want to do that. Well, the sad thing, one of them ends up dying in combat. The surviving soldier goes on to become an accomplished investor a seafood business owner, a husband, father, friend, all he met. He set records as a long distance runner, traveler, went to the White House several times, drank a ton of Dr. Peppers, um, even after he got shot in the buttocks, um, loved ice cream, um, the story of friendship and determination. And he ended up helping the family of the man who passed away. Um, 
little shrimp Fantastic. company. <laughs> yeah. Hey, my friends, it's a little fella by the name of Forrest Gump. Jab they wanted me that. to go in the army. I didn't Jab know if I was that. <laughs> Yeah, I wrote that. That was, <laughs> that was me just goofing. So overall, yeah. I think when I look at all the different articles that are coming out and God bless them. I think that that program that the Navy or that the army is putting together where they bring in folks that are overweight or underweight, they have the same type of situations that are going on. We've both, we've all essentially complimented that program, but it's like, are you putting that program on rose colored glasses? Essentially like whenever standard, how much does that affect the mission? Is it worth those numbers being elevated? Overall, I'm not sure what I think about that. I think I, I could see the reasoning behind how it's beneficial. But I think if you're going to do that, you can't send them to combat. Like if you need more bodies that are back home and doing supply and doing things like that, great. But sending them to combat, I think that's morally wrong. Yeah, it's not fair to them. It's not fair to the leadership. And ultimately, it's not fair to left or right. Right. And ultimately, you know, you got to look at it from the perspective of can we accomplish the mission with, mm -hmm. with these individuals or are they going to compromise mission accomplishment? And I, I think that that needs to be considered. But I, I am in favor of, you know, taking that time to like prep people before they like get to basic, to, you know, like doing like a pre program to get them to a you place where give it the attention it needs right. and you really are teaching a skill and preparing and whatever then like yes i think it could if it's done correctly yes but if not and i agree um not combat but it is a continued example of the old adage mission accomplishment and then troop welfare like the yeah it's one of the main things that the marine corps teaches you from the beginning we don't care if you're tired we don't care if you're hungry we don't care if you're tired we are going to accomplish the mission and I think this is that on a wide scale. And the military oftentimes doesn't even hide it. They're like, this is what we're doing. We're going to go out and we're going to get it done with whoever we can and consequences in their personal lives and their personal experiences essentially be damned. That's, what, mm -hmm. that's kind of what I think. Um, yeah, very interesting topic. And it definitely seems like it's applying today. It definitely applied in 2007 and 2008. But hopefully, because we're not at large scale conflict right now, we're in that drawdown period where it's not going to be as bad as it has been in the past. And the last thing I'll say, you wonder maybe going forward in the future, how much of this can be accomplished through, you know, drones or, or robot technology where you don't need bodies. You just need some way to accomplish the, the mission and you can just throw robots at it that, all right, if they caught time, but it's not a human life. Yeah, Ukraine is crushing it with just some drones that they picked up on Amazon, I think. Like, they're just flying them and dropping grenades into little positions, which is genius. And a little bit of help from the U.S. and our fine. Yeah. Oh, for you know, sure. Interesting. Speaking of Ukraine, I think it was Jack Murphy, <laughs> friend of the show, Jack Murphy, who was talking about it the other day, how, you know, what they're doing in Ukraine now, in addition to just you know, having the DOD is, is we're helping them from an agricultural standpoint and all these other departments where if we had taken that approach in Afghanistan or in Iraq, how we might've been more successful in um, maybe not creating a democracy, but creating a more sustainable uh, way of life for these people. I was extremely confused by that take when I saw it, because that's exactly what we did. Mm -hmm. it, part of um, I don't know that to the extent I know what you're talking about, Kate, where we like, you know, gave them, you know, farming equipment or seeds or things of that nature. But I don't know if it was like full scale, like, yeah, I mean, agriculture. I think the I and coin I think was so. infrastructure and we mm -hmm. spent billions of dollars on that farming shit, on building up their roads, giving them garbage, like all this shit. Yeah. But if it, like, like I remember one time my buddy Rob, gifted some some dude a, a backhoe or something if they don't know how to use it like what what good is that if you're just throwing money at something it doesn't necessarily equal success but yeah I think, I think you guys are essentially saying 
the same thing, but mm -hmm. yeah, Iraq, the Iraq police, the Afghanistan police, all funded by the United States and the coalition forces. I think that's what you're seeing in Ukraine now. I think it was Jack Murphy or Kate. I know you and I were talking about it yesterday. 56,000 first responders are being paid for by the United States. That's where a lot of those billions of dollars are going. And it goes on and on and on. We're doing the same things that we did in Afghanistan, the same things that we did in Vietnam, just without the bodies. And so yeah. to your point, Cons, I think that's exactly what we're doing right now. We're using, I'm going to say it again, those that Halliburton contract money to do different things over there, a little bit of a proxy war. Yeah, I wish I could see who in America is making the most money off this because, yeah. Somebody, I follow mixed, the money I have always. mixed feelings about it. I want Ukraine to kick Russia's ass. I think Russia is the bad guys here, but... uh I also believe it wouldn't be shocking to find a shit ton of corruption and a shit ton of kickbacks and a shit ton of other putting on my skepticism hat again. And, I think uh, it's a fine hat to wear. I mean, when you find out cat. more. Yeah. I mean, Halliburton and all those other companies that are like that, the military industrial complex is real, whether we want to admit it or not. But I think yeah. basically everybody admits it at this point that it's a, it's definitely a thing. Let's move on to some save rounds and alibis. Cons, I'll kick a question over to you. I saw you talking about it on Twitter this week about meeting parents and when yeah. is the appropriate time to meet some parents. Before you begin, I want to get Kate's thoughts on when she feels comfortable introducing a significant other to parents. I, Pat, when did Pat... I feel like Pat didn't meet my parents till I was knocked up. <laughs> so maybe Four before that? Baby? No, can't be when you had the baby. And my parents have never met his parents still. Um, but you live states apart. He never met my brother until my son was like a year old. Like, I don't think. Yeah, my parents didn't meet Alex's parents till we got engaged. Uh, like the day we got engaged, if I really? recall correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's yeah, also I because they live three hours apart there's and there wasn't mm -hmm. really a reason to ever bring them together actually wait ah i brought him down the shore to meet my family and that's when i got knocked up that's when you got knocked up yeah okay and the full and the fuller one. room yeah up, the fuller room the, yeah up in the high to bed up in the loft uh on a house yeah ooh, tmi anyways mm. ooh, yeah that's when yep good first impression yeah so that I think it's situationally dependent because I, I mean, like, you know, not to sound like any sort of, but I, you know, I had m many, not many, but a handful of folks that, you know, I, I knew and, and saw and dated casually that obviously didn't go anywhere. I love how so Kanz is like tiptoeing around it because his wife's in the other room. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of other bitches I was banging. <laughs> yeah. I was I was spreading my seed all over Hobo. <laughs> Yeah. So I would just say, I, I think it, you know, if, if you put a time on it, I, I said six months, cause I think just like six months is a good barometer for seriousness. And it, you know, prior to that, it, it's like, all right, well, how many people do you really want to introduce? Also, again, it's, I think it's a proximity thing. It's, it's an ease thing. Are there events where your parents are going to be that you would also be with another person socially? So I, I think it's very situationally dependent, but I, I put a barometer on it and said six months. And parents, too. I think the type of parents and how they interact with your significant other, or if they think that you should get married quickly and all that kind of stuff, I think it all plays in. All right. Any other save rounds for you, Cons? Yeah. So um, last weekend, um, Alex was away on a bachelorette trip. So I had it was just me and Maggie all weekend. I had a blast. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Luckily, I you know, I had some events, uh, some some activities to do with her Friday night. Uh, shout to my dad, his, him and his buddies, uh, from high school, their football team was the first state champs in their school's history. They've since had a ton, uh, but they are getting inducted into the hall of fame, uh, this fall. So, uh, they got honored at the game on the field before the game. So there was a big event, uh, like a, you know, I guess essentially a tailgate, uh, in one of their buildings, uh, up there at his school. So I, I bring her and I guess, you know, cause these guys are, you know, high school graduates in the seventies, a different era. Like I'm, I'm walking around with Maggie. At one point I, I dipped out to change a diaper and all these men and women too. They're like, wow, 
you're so you're, you're so great with her. It's unbelievable. Wow. How many diapers do you usually change? And I'm just like looking at I'm like, I don't I'm just kind of the bar is so low. The bar, the is, bar so is the low. floor. Yeah. The bar with dads, because then I heard some other stories about some other people. The bar is the floor. If you do like anything, you're seen as like, wow, you're really involved. Well, dad. How I'm many like, videos go viral where a dad puts his daughter's hair in a ponytail and everyone's like, yeah. oh my God, wow. The internet nuts, man. Like I yeah. I did it with Kelsey. There was a Kelsey was probably five or six. And I was a single dad. And yeah. no one gave a shit about that. But if I posted something of me taking Kelsey to get ice cream, people would be like, what a father. And I'm like, you should have seen it when she was puking at two o'clock in the morning. And I had to be up for PT at four 30 in the morning. Like yeah. that's when it was difficult, but you're right. Cons the barometer for what dudes <laughs> do is so low, man. Yeah. So and I look at you and I'm like, wow, his wife got to go away for a weekend and cons. I heard myself as one saying, Khan's like babysat her the whole weekend. And it's, but it's like, not babysitting. It's just, I I'm know, just being a right. I know, but I, right. like, I can't imagine what that's like. I'm like, wow, that must be amazing. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, I, like, I, look like that. That. I look at it like this. I look at it like this. Like, you know, when I, I go in her, her bassinet to like change her or when she wakes up in the morning and she smiles back at you. And, and I think to myself, what could be better? It's first it's like smile, such- first hug, elite. Oh, first yeah. smile, first hug. Just this hug. morning, just this morning, she laughed of the day, for the first time, like, audibly laughed. And, and I was like, come uh, out, come out, come out. I was uh, like, oh, wow, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah I, think I don't know. So if good. you're leaving your partner to do the bulk of the work, you're actually the one missing out on everything. Like, yeah, that's true. your loss. Yeah, um, yeah. So but overall, was- number one hug. What do you guys think? Number one hug from your kid. Ah, uh, she can't really hug yet, so I don't know that I'm uh, in a position to answer this. And we just lost Chaps' audio; can't hear him now. I think can't he knocked his now. microphone off. I don't I'll know. say when my son gets up in the morning and he's still sleepy as a toddler now, and he like molds to me as I walk yeah. him down the stairs. I'm yeah. like, oh my god, this is the best thing ever. Um, your audio is just... still gone. No, he's screaming now. Nothing. I don't yeah, know. I um, just no. Just when she smiles at me. Like ah. she, cause now we're at, we're, you know, she'll be three months old on the 29th and now she can kind of recognize us. So she sees you. She, I mean, just this morning I was feeding her and she's, you know, milk drunk. She got her eyes like kind of like half open and then she opens and she sees me and she just smiles. <laughs> oh, it's just, it's it really best. is the best. It really is the best. So like I hear about all these dads who like don't get up with their kid or, you know, leave the 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 spouse to just do it all and i'm like you're missing out there's just That's these it. feelings you get when your your child smiles back at you it's just awesome so and moms that was great don't forget fellas moms don't forget. yeah Can you um me? yes yeah. now we got you okay. back chaps i have so, the answer that i was looking for post bath when they're still yeah. using johnson and johnson and they're in a little towel and their head's a little bit wet top tier number one hug in my opinion Oh yeah, yeah, that's a good one. I love doing baths too. Uh, this is basically so I, Podfathers now. <laughs> I I have a little note that we're talking about PT, and what does that stand for in the military? Physical, physical training. Physical training. Physical training. I'm going to some PT physical therapy. That was what that phone call I got was to confirm on Thursday. Guess what it's for? Oh, I know. Well, I saw you tweet about it, but yeah. this is interesting. Go My ahead. Pussy. <laughs> All right. Yep. I don't think they call it that, but yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Basically, I blew it out. I've talked about it at length on this show when I gave birth the last time. And it was okay. But then once I got super pregnant, all my organs started to fall through my bussy area. Okay. (laughs) It's the craziest shit you've ever seen. Um, And What do we mean falling out? Like legit coming out or like just like picture, moving to the bottom? Picture a skeleton's hip bones. And you know how there's like the hole right there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's where your holes are and stuff and like whatever. All my muscles and organs are falling through that thing like a tub of gack coming down. Okay. I can literally push. Not like up and down. I don't care. You guys are like, whatever. No, We're in the keep going. Yeah. 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 I can like literally push it my organs back up and they're like 
And then they start coming. The down. idea that you can touch your organs is a little uncomfortable for me. <laughs> yeah, Kate, I got to admit, that seems bad. It's yeah. bad and it <laughs> feels bad. bad all day long. If I'm on my feet for more than five minutes, I'm like, uh oh, my uterus is falling out. Can we head home? Like, it feels terrible. Like, yeah. it is the worst. And I thought it's like, I thought it was like embarrassing, or whatever. And then I talked about it on my Instagram. I got a million messages from women right away being like, oh my God, no, you're right. It happens to a ton of us. And I even had some uh, relatives reach out and be like, yeah, I needed surgery to like, keep, like people have to get surgery, whatever. Like a liver lift. So I asked my doctor and she's like, <laughs> oh, you can do PT for that. I'm So I'm going Thursday. What does that entail? You got to go live, Kate. You got to go live. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering. It's gonna go live on CBT's Instagram. Do I need to shave? Like, are they gonna? Is there gonna be like a physical therapist dude with sweatbands on, like having me lift oh. weights with my bussy? Like, what? <laughs> Richard Simmons up in the there. Richard Simmons of bussies. Yeah. <laughs> like what? What? What are I they gonna know. do? Pregnancy know, is shout to up. women, man. <laughs> well, it reminded me. Barstool's blogged it. There's this lady who does vagina strength competitions. Where she'll take like a 50 pound weight, put it on like a dildo, puts the dildo up in her on the stair, and she's like, check this out. I'm holding 50 pounds with my puss. And that's what I think it's going to be like. She can hold well, a I can't wait to hear. I wouldn't want, to hear. that's not the By type of screen. person that I would want to have sex with because it seems like her vagina would empty you like you were a goger. Like it would just be <laughs> yeah. awful. <laughs> yeah. And then rip it right off. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So that I'm just terrible. curious. That's TMI, but I feel like I've crossed this plane of um, TMI that I just, I like don't exist in my own brain anymore. So I don't mind you're being like, like guess you're 37 weeks pregnant. I think you're allowed to have whatever thoughts you want to. Anyway, yeah. so stay tuned for the next episode when I tell you what pelvic floor PT is, aka boozy PT. I don't know. Mm. I can't mm. wait. That's good. <laughs> Hopefully, you don't get put in remedial PT for that. <laughs> you need a waiver I Kate's hope you got, don't mind I brought a no shave chit for this one Kate's got a category 4 vagina <laughs> probably probably <laughs> yeah alright I don't think I think that's kind of where we should end the show just talking about yeah. Kate's bussy we'll be Bye. back here for another bussy hour next week so join us we'll see you then down the retreat Ooh. can you guys uh, stay on